네, 월가 트레이더 버니의 미국 주식 시간으로 돌아왔습니다. 투자는 타이밍이라는 말이 있죠. 관련돼서 이렇게 타이밍의 귀재들은 어떻게 투자를 하는지 그 투자 포지션에 대해서 오늘은 내용을 준비해 주셨다고 하니까요. 준비해 주신 내용 지금 바로 만나보시죠. So I want to think about how investors came in and out of the markets here in terms of Uh, significant investors, how they positioned themselves, and what happened. Okay, what we did see, and this is a chart of five-week net changes, okay, in uh, speculative positioning of futures contracts. So the S&P 500 futures contract, the NASDAQ futures contract, the Dow Jones futures contract. What happened, how much positioning changed and what we can find here is that if we look at this going back okay we can see significant times where we've positioned okay this was 2008 and we have these big sell-offs um, where the, the percentage of of selling over a five-week window becomes fairly significant. And what we have right here in all these other times, except for even this one um, early on in 2007, we still hung out for a while. We didn't break down until after we saw Bear Stearns declare bankruptcy and then Lehman Brothers declare bankruptcy in 2008. But all these other conditions, what happened was there was almost, I don't want to say, but there was an overwhelming amount of selling of futures contracts in a five-week period. And every time we've had those, those have been significant bottoms. So we had that running into 2000, uh, the 2000, March 2022 bottom. Now, we've also talked about sentiment, and I just want to keep reviewing what happened and why it was so interesting in here. So what we have here, obviously, is the S&P on the top, okay? And then what I have here is two lines together. The um, American Association of Institutional Investors um, have a... Uh, the blue line is the percentage of people that are bullish. The red line is the percentage of people that are bearish. And this line right here is the difference between the two of them. So what we really want to see is occurrences where we get very bearish in terms of high number of people bearish, okay, and um, up here, and then very low number of people bullish. And every one of those has been at a very attractive price. Remember, we combined that with the put call ratio and just like we looked about on the clip before the number the amount of selling of futures contracts a, over a five week window and then we look at the lack of liquidity remember we talked about the low amount of bids and offers as the market breaks down into a low so when we can combine all those three things we have a very attractive setup to be able to purchase stocks and have them go higher over an extended period of time. Now, one other thing what we can think about is also to identify what happened. When we look at commercial hedgers and what they did, what we found is, and I put these in red arrows, these are all the times that the commercial hedgers purchased stock in a significant amount. And all of those stocks occurred, all of those big purchases occurred at levels that were ex post facto, after the fact, lows in the market. So what we saw here was we saw a big purchase after COVID, okay? And then as the market started to go higher, they lightened up and lightened up and lightened up. And then they started to be basically, they really put on a hedge. And at the bottom of the market, that hedge was more significant than it has been during this entire time. After that, there was a tremendous amount of buying. And this is a significant amount. This takes us into the end of March. So this chart's about a week old. But what's happened is, is that they now hold more than $53 billion worth of futures contracts net long which 
exceeded the number that we had of 48 billion after the COVID um, move in May of 2020. And finally, what we think about is, okay, so we've had this move, we've had this stock market breakdown, but what's happened to other stock markets around the world? And let's just think about Europe, because Europe has the Russia-Ukraine problem. And what we can see here is that European stocks since 2005 have always traded at a fractional discount to the U.S. stock market. So in other words, the U.S. stock market has led the whole rally since 2005, generally speaking. So we never went to a premium to the U.S. market where the European stocks outperformed the U.S. market. But what we've seen now is since 2015, we've seen a market where we had a big stock market rally in the United States, and Europe failed to lead or failed to keep up with us, so that discount started to expand. And then, as we've seen uh, Putin invade Ukraine, that discount exploded and has now gotten down to the lowest level we've had since 2005. Whether we think about what's going on with Putin and how this is all going to end up and what's going to happen with Russia, um, do sanctions work? History would say they don't. Um, but we are putting on sanctions. Europe is putting on sanctions. But if we think about our sanctions, we've been slow to the gun um, to be able to put the sanctions on. In other words, we've been slow. Uh, we have not thought about this ahead of time. We're kind of coming in slower than probably Ukraine wants. And the other thing is, yes, Europe has followed with us, but Europe has also said, hey, we've got all these exceptions because Germany wants oil, Germany wants energy, Germany wants liquefied natural gas. Um, we need to be, con they think they need to be concerned about getting wheat. Uh, the uh, African, North African countries are huge buyers of wheat out of Russia. Uh, India continues to buy uh, oil from Russia. Uh, Biden is discussing right now with India trying to get them to be able to stop doing some of this, to be able to put more heat on. Uh, Russia has said you can only buy uh, crude oil if you buy it in rubles to be able to support the ruble because nobody else is going to use rubles right now. So we have to think about this. Then the other thing Russia said is, hey, we've got this wheat stocks. We're only going to sell our wheat stocks to our friends. Well, let's see where all this goes. Wheat is a very interesting commodity because every two to three months around the world, we have a new wheat harvest, whether it's Australia, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Russia, whether it's Germany, whether it's France, whether it's the United States, whether it's Argentina, whether it's Brazil, all these countries have huge wheat crops, in Canada, all these countries have huge wheat crops. And wheat is like a weed, okay? You can throw seed on the ground and it's amazing. You don't put fertilizer down and it just grows. So unless you have a major drought, wheat's going to turn out to be an okay crop. Um, so whether we can overcome the fact that Russia, who is the largest wheat exporter in the world, okay, whether we can overcome that factor um, with additional harvests at other places is going to be something we're going to have to wait to see. Australia just had a second record harvest that they've done, and they're selling their wheat out. But the price of bread's up everywhere, and the price of bread inside of Russia is up significantly even though they have all that wheat.